My title is, uh, as people, the film buffs amongst you will know, is a pun on um, uh, a film by Terence Davis called Distant Voices, Still, Still Lives, um, which was a film about growing up in working class Liverpool in uh, the post-war period. Um, and our topic, of course, is research, and often felt to be, by people doing it, people in universities like this, to be distant from uh, policymakers and the people in positions of power. Um, but if their lives are unstill, it is because politics is changing. The other half of the equation is this uh, changing political landscape. Um, and so what I want to do uh, in these remarks tonight is to look at this relationship, and I'll say a little bit about how I see it having evolved in the post-war period, um, bring it up to date to talk a little bit about the kind of current landscape of research and evidence-based policy, the kind of actors that are now engaged in policy making, the changes that are taking place because of uh, data and technology, new centres of research and so on, uh, and then have a look, sort of segue into looking at how politics is changing. So the people who are on the, if you like, the, the people that you're trying to influence and to use your research, the people that you're trying to talk to, how that's changing uh, given the rise of populist forces, new kinds of conviction politician pressures on mainstream parties, and then conclude a little bit with some new ways of thinking about this relationship between research, knowledge, science, and power and policy making. I'm going to start with um, uh, a guy that may be known to some of you, prob probably not many of you. Uh, this is Harold Wilensky. He was um, an American political economist, um, uh, uh, also wrote uh, extensively on uh, social policy questions, well, welfare states, wrote, wrote books on um, the evolution of welfare states in advanced democracies, um, wrote about organisational forms. Um, but one of the things he did write towards the end of his career, he died about five years ago now, but um, after re re retiring he wrote a paper um, reflecting on his career and thinking about the things that he'd done and the people that he talked to in the, lo in the long course of his research on what are the circumstances in which, or what are the political economic conditions in which research is closest to, most engaged with, and used by policymakers? Um, and this is the article he did, uh, it was a, a piece in the Journal of Health, Politics, Policy and Law. And Wilensky's basic argument, and I'll come back to some of the other things he said uh, later on, but his basic argument was that in liberal market economies with fragmented, uh, decentralised and often very polarised politics, um, <clears throat> research finds it very difficult to get into and uh, to be taken seriously by policymakers. Uh, you do lots of short-run evaluations, lots of research that's done for uh, uh, cost-benefit analyses of things that can be used by policymakers, but more the deeper, systemic, integrated, often critical thinking that takes place in universities, harder to uh, bring to bear on policymaking. And his argument was that in the more coordinated market economies of Northern Europe in particular, where there are you know, m major institutions in the labour market, coordinated wage bargaining between unions and employers, where the state has long-term investments in the coordination of the economy, then researchers, uh, what, what is undertaken in universities, but also within research centres within uh, trade unions or within the state itself, there knowledge has a much more long-term integrated relationship with policymaking, much more consensual, much less short-term. Um, so that was his basic, if you like, the sort of argument he set up, and uh, we'll come back to some of the other things he said later. And I wanted to use that really as, as a frame of thinking of, for, for thinking about the United Kingdom. You know, where do we sit um, in relationship to that kind of basic thesis? Because we are thought of, usually when, when we do this analysis of the varieties of capitalism in, in the world, we think of Britain as a liberal market economy, much closer to the US than to Northern Europe. Um, and I want to sort of think about that, in particular in, res in respect of where we sit today. But if we look at the post-war um, policy paradigm, thinking of it as a kind of ideal type, there was in the post-war period a lot of expertise vested in institutions of social partnership, whether it was in wages councils, whether it was in um, uh, forms of governance over other parts of the economy, uh, levy boards for training and so on. You would have a lot of economists, others studying the labour market, people doing... Uh, research into um, particular challenges vested in institutions of social partnership, a lot of professional discretion over policy and practice. Um, if you were a teacher, you weren't told how to teach by a minister. You know, it was your job to determine what you taught in the classroom. Uh, academics had considerable freedom, uh, and universities considerable autonomy from the state, albeit mediated through 
um, bodies between themselves. And those bodies, local authorities, much higher autonomy than they had, uh, than they have today or uh, uh, in the last sort of 20 years or so, relative autonomy for local authorities, for funding councils and for those kind of quasi-state agencies. And a relatively weak state, if you like, delivery architecture. This is before the era of inspections, of audits, of targets, of performance indicators, and so on. Um, so uh, the state itself wasn't utilising knowledge to deploy uh, in, the kinds of t in the terms that we, which we come to experience it in the more recent past, and I'll come on to that. Mm -hmm. And you get um, a much more frequent use of royal commissions, where people are asked, um, who are recognised as experts, often chaired by somebody great and good, go away and look at an issue for three or four years, come back and report to the government, make your recommendations. Probably the most famous example, the Robbins Committee in the 1960s, you know, led to the big expansion of uh, university, university education uh, in the UK. Now that starts to change uh, as the kind of post-war Keynesian consensus comes under stress and pressure starts to change in the 1980s in particular. And you see a widening gap opening up between academics and the government. Um, <clears throat> Academics under the pressure of new forms of research assessment, peer review becomes more important than perhaps speaking to uh, people in positions of power. Conversely, government starts to walk away, not from all forms of knowledge, of course not, but from some forms of knowledge which is deemed to be, if you like, less useful or appropriate or where there's a sense that universities are conducting research with a particular kind of bias. Um, and totemic of that was the cancellation in the 1980s of the longitudinal studies which had taken place since the war. We had a 1946 birth cohort study, done again in 1958, done again in 1970. Doesn't take place in the 1980s. We have to wait until the year 2000 for it to reappear. Uh, into that gap between universities and government and policymakers come think tanks. Uh, first on the right, uh, Adam Smith Institute, Center for Policy Studies, predating those um, uh, but becoming more influential in the 1980s, um, the Institute for Economic Affairs and organisations like mine, as we've just heard, created 25 years ago, as well in part as a response to that. But the growth of think tanks and others is, as intermediaries, as people that occupy a nodal point between university research and policymakers, and often also as outriders for policy uh, agendas. <clears throat> You get the decline and fall of social partnership institutions, the abolition of things like the levy boards um, in the labour market, um, uh, research institutes in different sectors of the economy, the nationalised industries would have their own public research institutes and centres. Those begin to get abolished or, or privatised, they start to disappear. You get an increased centralisation of government in this period, lots of functions taken up from local uh, authorities, so the state starts to centralise um, and then the rise of the new public management, very famously in the sort of, and this is across advanced economies, not just in the UK, but you start to see the development of new forms of accountability, of league tables, of inspectorates, of quasi-markets in public services, and within government itself, a strengthening of the centre in, in Whitehall, a strengthening of the reach of number 10, uh, a strengthening of the treasury vis-a-vis -vis other departments, uh, much less autonomy given to cabinet ministers than they might have experienced um, in the post-war period. Uh, and, of course, in common with that, uh, the curtailing of the power of the professions, particularly of professions deemed to be um, uh, insufficiently kind of uh, secure in their own knowledge base. So teachers and others are very vulnerable to having the state um, uh, invade what had previously been their areas of uh, professional discretion and autonomy. And you get this very interesting, the decline of royal commissions. The model of going out to a commission sort of ceases, and this is just a graph to show you that. You can see all these Royal Commissions, and then they just stop in the 1980s. Thatcher just makes no use of them at all. Um, and the last one here is one done on um, social care uh, for the Blair government, uh, whose recommendations were largely ignored. Um, Wilson obviously really liked them, <laughs> quite a few in the mid-60s. Um, but they decline as a mode of doing policy making, emblematic perhaps of this, of this shift. So where are we today? So what's happening today when we look at the new, the new landscape of research? Um, well, a lot of things uh, remain, haven't changed since the 1980s. There's persistence as well as change. There's, there, there are lots of things that remain the same. But here are some new ones. So first one, very well known now, the, the rise of big data in policy making uh, and open data, government m making its data available to citizens, to researchers, to others, public service data 
being used much more extensively for thinking about the evidence base for reform of public services. Um, Open data white paper there. Whitehall starts to do a lot more of this now. It started to happen when I was at number 10 under Gordon Brown. Tim Berners-Lee, the uh, inventor of the World Wide Web, asked to come in to government to help open up the, the data sets. First one, actually, that he managed to unlock was a data set on cycle deaths in London, um, where Transport for London had the data on where cyclists were being killed. Uh, that was made available to the public. The data set was put into the public realm. And within about half a day, 12 hours, some geeks in Shoreditch had turned that into a Google map, showing you where people were being killed, um, so that citizens themselves could um, use that data set to determine what areas in London to avoid. Now, we still, of course, have many cycle deaths, but this was a, an early example of a sort of public good use of uh, open data. And if you look at this from the, this is from the OECD, um, which has started to track this, it has this open data index. Um, it's all quite provisional at the moment, but the UK uh, is over here next to Korea and France <coughs> in its, the openness of its data. So it, it's very, very advanced compared to um, many other OECD countries. And uh, um, others would perhaps expect to be doing better. Sweden and others down here, uh, Turkey basically not, not making anything available at all. Um, but this is obviously a clear trend across advanced democracies, that public data being opened up for use by researchers, citizens and others. There we are. There's, there's Great Britain. Another big development, the rise of, sort of what work centres and um, the rise of uh, randomised control trials. So this is an initiative launched by the government in 2013, um, a network of so-called what work centres. It was part of the civil service reform plan. Uh, here they are. These are the policy themes, local economic growth, health and social care, well-being, early intervention, crime reduction, education achievement. Um, some of these are really only just getting started now, but these are deemed to be centres of knowledge for particular policy questions and issues. Uh, probably the most advanced, in my experience, education achievement, where the Education Endowment Foundation has given um, significant resources by the government, significant resources, millions and millions, uh, and it effectively funds randomised control trials. That's what it does. Um, in part because of a suspicion of educational research produced in universities. So the government deliberately decides to create a centre which has an evidence base um, that is you know, uh, out with what, what uh, is being done in, in the universities. And I'll come back to this, but one of the interesting questions here, of course, is that what works, I mean, what, what does that mean? What does that question mean? Who determines what, what should work, what can work? Uh, is it just a randomised control trial that you use to determine that? Uh, an important question. But that's a big new development. And I suppose the, the most, the best known of some of this uh, is the Behavioural Insights team. Um, now spun out of the Cabinet Office, it's, it's become a kind of, uh, it's part owned by, by the government, but it's now hosted in, in an organisation called Nesta. And using uh, all these sort of advances in the behavioural sciences, behavioural economics in particular, um, <coughs> to start to look at public policy questions. And again, the gold standard a randomised control trial. That's what you want to get to. Um, another issue, open policy making. Um, here, a deliberate attempt by government to open up engagement with um, uh, the policy making processes. Um, so to, to move away from the kind of closed Whitehall based policy making processes, there is now an open policy making unit in the Cabinet Office. Much of what it does um, if you like, and this is just a grid from its, um, from its website, it's almost mimicking uh, tech development, you know, thinking about how, when, you, when you've got companies doing innovations in, uh, you know, digital technology, social media, things of this kind, um, how do they develop ideas and products and prototypes? And can you, can you think about that when you, when you come to do research, you know, trial some things, push them out, test them, bring them back, and so on, open them up, open source engagement, you know, using networks to um, understand and, and feedback on your ideas. So innovation, open channels, open to challenge, open to engagement. <coughs> so this is a sort of new viewpoint from the Cabinet Office built with this new unit um, trying to make government look and feel more like the kind of developments that you get in sectors of the economy which are heavily reliant on digital and tech. Uh, and then uh, another development, innovation teams, related to these others but somewhat different. 
These are um, public service laboratories, public service teams uh, established particularly in city governments. So the mayor of New York has one. There's one in the Malaysian government, uh, not one in Colombia. Um, uh, all over the world springing up these sort of teams that are created very specifically uh, by public service leaders and politicians to do innovation in public services, to think about um, public service problems and come up with innovative <coughs> solutions to them. And again, very much based on the sort of mimicry of uh, technological companies and products and services, to have people trialling, testing, prototyping, um, feedback, junking things when they don't work, taking more risks, etc., etc. So lots of different kinds of methods used, uh, very heavy reliance on impact measurement, lots of partnerships with civil society and companies and others, uh, again, lots of use of data. But this is definitely a trend. You see this across a number of countries now. Uh, and then, of course, uh, universities responding also, just as, as Bath has done, by creating new institutes for policy research, trying to bring their knowledge together in ways that can then be brought to bear on policy making to have an impact for that research. You see the Cambridge Centre for Science and Policy at the King's Mile End, a very good one at UCL too. This is clearly also a trend that's taking place. Uh, so a marshalling of resources on the side of universities and researchers too. Uh, and then there's a continued growth of think tanks and policy consultancy. So here's mine and here are all these other uh, different think tanks. Uh, I like to think that ours is a lot better than most of those there. Um, the quality of some of these is uh, a bit iffy, you might say. Um, but it's clear that this new landscape of think tanks and of people engaged in policy making you know, isn't going away. It's, it's growing rather than decreasing. Um, as I say, very variable. And in the US, which has long had the largest sort of community of think tanks in Washington, much more polarized and partisan than in the UK. In the US, funded often by particular interests, um, apart from the long established ones like Brookings, there's a, you know, there just are think tanks which are now essentially effectively partisan operations. But in the UK, it's not so much like that. Uh, and there is now a plethora of, uh, of these uh, think tanks and institutes, and they have a big impact on policy debate. That's what they're there for. They're there to, uh, as I said earlier, to be the sort of nodal point between research and policy, and they have a big media presence. And you know, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, during, during an election campaign, it's the arbiter. It's the trusted arbiter. What it says is determined to be uh, the arbiter of um, you know, what's <coughs> true or not with the claims made by politicians. And then finally, there's the growth of this, which is a rather new phenomenon, again enabled by technology in many ways, is the growth of frontline practitioners becoming kind of research active. So research ed is, is basically um, as spreading across the world. It's basically teachers and others wanting to do research themselves or to understand research evidence and utilise it themselves, not to just be recipients, not to be given research from a What Works Centre or from a government minister, but to be active uh, scholars and pra or practicing research, uh, utilizing research in their in their working lives, and rather more critical, I suppose, is this. This is a block called guerrilla politics, which um, says, look, we we are setting ourselves up in order to bring the experience of people on the front line back into policy making. Um, so much more critical. People working in benefits offices, people working in the immigration service, people working. In, in frontline services saying this is what we are experiencing, often anonymously, but it's a deliberate attempt to use technology to get frontline experience into policymakers. And of course, uh, you know, one of the interesting things that is created by uh, new technology is the ability to short circuit any mechanism. You can get straight into a special advisor's office because they can read you on their phone. You can get straight into a minister's, you can write a blog about your uh, experience in a classroom and it can be in front of a minister tomorrow. You haven't got to go through anybody, you know, you, you just do it. And, it, and, and if, if it's read, it's read. Um, so this is another phenomenon that, that seems to be sort of uh, developing is, is uh, this um, unmediated frontline presence in research debate. Um, now, so on the other side of the uh, equation then, what's happening to politics? How does all this, um, in, as it were, relate to the, to the changes in policy? This is um, just a cover of, our, of the journal that Jane mentioned earlier that we, we published, uh, which we did before the election. Um, just designed to show uh, the arrival of uh, Mr. Farage with his pint and his cigarette, um, the new populist forces. Um, but we see across the European Union the decline of stable two-party politics. Um, and we can go more widely around the world, but it's certainly true in the, in the European Union. This is just the UK figure. 
of the decline in support for the two parties in the post-war period. 1951 election, 97% vote, vote, vote Tory or Labour. Uh, 2010 is down to 65. Picks up a little bit of the last election, 67%, but still uh, the secular trend is towards the decline of the vote share of the two main parties. And of course in recent years, uh, visibly and graphically demonstrated in the leadership debates, not just uh, two parties with a third party coming along, but three, four, five parties. Um, in the case of the UK, obviously the SNP, the Greens, uh, UKIP and so on. Uh, and you see this also uh, reflected in the decline in party membership in most of Europe. Uh, the Green Line is the UK, so you see that this precipitate decline in uh, mass party membership down to where we are now with membership at around the sort of 200,000 mark uh, for the, you know, the Labour Party and others. Uh, Spain bucks that trend, obviously, because it's coming out of an author authoritarian um, uh, period into a democracy, but the trend is basically to a decline in the established parties and their, and their membership. Uh, you get the rise of populist parties and populist forces um, across Europe, and they break differently. Um, so the, this is just from the Economist. These are the, the red ones are you know, Podemos in Spain, um, now at about 20 percentage points in the polls, captured Barcelona in, uh, in the last municipal elections. Five star movement in Italy, less, less easily quantifiable as left or right. Uh, so is it in Greece, obviously now in, in, in government. Um, and then far more of the shift towards populist forces in Northern Europe takes place towards the right. Uh, the Danish People's Party now, uh, the Danish election, the dominant force on the right, Front National, the Alliance for Germany, more of a, it's called the Bourgeois Professors Party in Germany, as you probably know, but this anti-Euro party, Golden Dawn in Greece, um, uh, probably the largest explicitly fascist party in the south of Europe, uh, Jobbik in Hungary, very powerful nationalist party, and so on. So th this, this strong growth in these forces, which are breaking up the left blocks, um, a lot of core support from left parties going across to them, uh, but also challenging on the right uh, uh, as well. And, you know, the upshot of that is just, again, the European Parliament. You just see this, you know, here, the main left-right blocks, they get joined by these right-wing forces and others. The traditional, the Greens actually di dipping a little bit there. But again, just giving you uh, an illustration of this pluralism in politics, and a challenge to the mainstream parties and a challenge to uh, established methods of policy making conducted through established parties. Just changes the landscape in politics. And at the same time, the mainstream parties uh, facing this challenge from populist forces, facing the remaking of their political landscape, uh, left, and this is a phrase from the um, people will know from the late, the late great Peter Mayer, political scientist Peter Mayer. Uh, a, a student of political parties who wrote this um, book shortly before he died called Ruling the Void. Uh, and the, his thesis was that um, mainstream political parties had over time lost their moorings in civil society. Labour parties had lost their support in the, the organised working class. They'd increasingly gravitated towards the state, much more state-centric. Power and position in a party often dependent on places in a state hierarchy, special advisor jobs, then you become a leader, etc. So promotion routes less reliant on growing up and going through trade unions and others, much more about the state. Um, but also increasingly, in his, in his argument, seeking to govern responsibly, being less responsive to the demands of citizens. In a rather telling phrase Peter Mayer had, which was that um, mainstream parties no longer represented people's interests to the state, but they represented the state to people. Um, but he said that they came to come to rule the void because their scope for action was increasingly constrained, constrained by global forces, constrained by multilateral agreements of their governments and so on, but also over what they could spend. So this is a, and of course, you know, a large part of the business of government is tax and spend. It's what you spend. It's what you offer to your electorates. This is just from the German political economist Wolfgang Streeck. Uh, if you can see this graph. This is basically just plotting um, German uh, uh, federal expenditure. Uh, the bit at the top is the discretionary spending. You know, goes from sort of 40% in 1970, shrinks up to here to about 20%. And in large part, that's because of accumulated obligations to pensioners, paying out on pensions, social security subsidies, um, growth of um, uh, health service expenditure and so on, debt servicing, 
offset to a degree, and certainly in the case of the UK, very largely offset by uh, defence expenditure uh, declining from the post <coughs> period, and it's certainly true for the UK, a big drop in proportion of GDP. But the basic argument here is, is that mainstream parties just have less room for manoeuvre. They, they have less they can offer to their electorates. Um, and, so, and, and in an age of austerity in particular, and austerity fiscal policies are pursued, actively cutting expenditure, um, and therefore less able to offer things by way of response to and to, and to challenge uh, the rise of populist forces who can more authentic or appear to more authentically express the interests of people voting for them, to not have an interest in being the responsible party but to be the responsive party. So a lot of space created for populism and less room for mainstream parties to <coughs> respond, um, less capability to respond. <coughs> and at the same time, uh, you start to also see the nation state coming under pressure, obviously loses power up to multinational forms of governance like the EU, WTO and others, but also beginning to start to see dispersion of power within the nation state, the devolution and the rise of new power sources. This is the Scottish, famous Scottish vow. There's the, an enduring settlement. I put a question mark next to that because many will think it, it won't endure at all, that we've still got a lot more change to come in Scotland. Um, but we've also got this new uh, devo, devolution process taking place in, in England to metro city regions, Manchester at the sort of forefront of that, the combined authority in Manchester. More power, of course, going to Wales too. Italy, in, in, Renzi in Italy has just <coughs> created new forms of metropolitan governance. Um, we saw major devolution in the 1980s in France. Spain obviously has had you know, a, a highly devolved, decentralised system for a long time. So many more of these, of these, uh, of these uh, European nation states becoming more decentralised and new forms of power uh, arising within them. Again, complicating the landscape, complicating the political landscape. You're no longer dealing with uh, a transmission of knowledge to power in very stable, centralised locations. It's pluralising and decentralising. Um, Northern powerhouse and so on. And then finally, um, the emergence of new forms of political leadership. And um, uh, this is, a, I, I, I think, a more, I mean, there's an emerging <coughs> literature now on, on political leadership, a very interesting one. Um, and <coughs> it was a bit more schematic, this, but um, I thought it was worth trying to sort of talk through this a little bit. So if you're thinking of Wilensky's structure, you know, he would have over here the Northern Europeans, Merkel, there's Juncker there, uh, consensus-based, more in the middle of politics, um, governing more pragmatically, respecting sources of power and knowledge outside in civil society and coordinated market economies. Um, versus over here, this is Stephen Harper, <coughs> Prime Minister of Canada, Tony Abbott, and I put the Prime Minister in, in the middle. Harper in Canada probably, probably lose power later this year, um, but has uh, been in power first as a minority government leader and then as a majority government leader. Highly conviction, ideological-led government. Um, uh, it really governs from a very sort of small clique of interests, hostile to often to the civil service, hostile to what's produced in the universities. Tony Abbott, not as successful as Harper, but in a similar mould. These are Anglosphere political leaders of the right um, who embody, if you like, a very strong form of... Con if you like, a, a, a deliberate attempt to kind of govern from um, a conviction position rather than from a broader consensus position. And then on the left, um, a rather different dynamic at work. Over here, Podemos and Syriza um, responding to uh, austerity in Europe, practicing a different kind of politics. Hollande and Ed Miliband, maybe of the more, at least to begin with, Hollande has changed more recently, um, more traditional social democratic, but trying to respond to some of that populist agenda by developing a different kind of economic agenda. Uh, but over here, the kind of strong leader model for the left of kind of, you know, Blair and Renzi, who very much sees himself in the Blairite mould uh, in Italy. And Obama somewhere in the middle, still, um, still playing some populist tunes, but also, you know, the... the the responsible Democrat uh, leader. So on the left, you don't see the same division of leadership that you see on the right, but you do see different, a different kind of pull factors at work, you know, from a much more, um, if you like, more a sort of populist movement on the left, left populism, versus a sort of strong uh, centrist um, 
uh, strong leader model which Renzi and, and Blair embody perhaps, and then these others who you might argue are sort of caught in the middle here, um, uh, politically caught in the middle. So um, what does that mean then for, 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 for where I started, these political economic regimes? So it would appear very much here that instead of having a sort of one camp of liberal market economies with their political leaders and over here the coordinated market economies with their more consensual leaders, that these forms of uh, political economic regime are sort of much more in flux, challenged uh, by all sorts of forces of the kinds I've just described, and therefore the notion of a sort of linear transmission between knowledge and power, whether it's um, you know, in universities towards the state, is sort of breaking, breaking down. And so what would we conclude from that? Well, so the distinction that Walensky started with between these policymaking structures and advanced democracies appear um, less to hold now because of this political fragmentation, because of the rise of populism. It's a more complex political landscape with more opportunities but also more, um, more difference. <coughs> then, you, then you clearly have um, technological development with big data, open data, networking, social and political networking, opening up research and policy making to greater contestability. Um, both inside and outside the state, more people able to use technology to uh, uh, access policymakers, policymakers themselves able to use it to open up greater uh, contestability. Um, and again, some less stability in that, but opportunities as well as threats. My, my third point, this sort of paradoxical coexistence between uh, these sort of new technocratic forms of evidence and research gathering, which I talked about, sort of what works centres the sort of gold standard RCT, um, which, you know, also sometimes appear to coexist with this sort of increased conviction of ideological governance. And perhaps the best example of this is um, Michael Gove as Education Secretary. <coughs> you know, Michael Gove, um, as people will know, had a very, very strong agenda, um, very strong sense of what he wanted to achieve, uh, thought of as a very, you know, a, a, a successful Conservative minister with an agenda. Uh, but at the same time, commissioned Ben Goldacre, the science writer, to do a report for him on um, the use of evidence in education and uh, the use of RCTs in uh, education policy making and, um, and then funded this education endowment centre. Um, so at the same time as having kind of very strong uh, conviction politics, not interested in waiting a long time for academic evidence or waiting for what my researchers might tell him was the right thing to do, um, you know, proceeding with a very ideologically driven agenda at the same time establishing these new what work centres. And uh, so you get this paradoxical coexistence of these different <coughs> forces and trends. And then also, in, when we're thinking, going back to the kind of ideal types in the post-war period and then the changes in the 1980s, now a much more mixed set of different kinds of state reforms. So you've still got your um, lots of the kind of architecture of the delivery state of inspectorates and audits and uh, league tables and so on. You've got the use of some market mechanisms uh, in things like education and health still. But you've also got more democratic um, forms of governance. You're devolving some power down to uh, <coughs> below the nation state level. You're enabling pe new people to come into playing pr the provision of state services. And technology is opening up new spaces for people to engage in policy making. <coughs> so quite a, again, a sort of a, 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 a landscape in which there are different forms of uh, public service reform taking place at the same, at the same time. Uh, and last last slide. So the one of the things that Wilensky also concluded was this: was that um, lots of things happen um, which uh, politicians can do nothing about. Demographics, aging societies, uh, <coughs> the rising living standards, the desire for um, uh, more um, power and wealth in advanced societies, what that does to them. Uh, what he says is, look, you know, there are lots of things that. <coughs> Are, are just deeper trends that policymakers uh, have very little to do with. They push you in certain directions, but it's really important that researchers, particularly in universities, are able to continue to take that long view, to give it articulation, to understand it, express it, and bring it into public consciousness. And one of his strongest arguments is that um, you have to have, if you do applied research, if you, if you do applied research, you have to have something to apply. Um, and that often policy, uh, sort of research, has an impact on policy in a, in a, on a much longer time frame. It changes the habits of thought, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, as Keynes said, we're all sort of 
beholden to some dead economist ideology. And in a sense, Walensky's saying that's true. There are these, um, <coughs> over the longer term, how research impact, impacts on policymakers is it frames the way in which we think about things. And Keynes is one of his examples, you know, very, very powerful uh, for, for <coughs> in, the, in, in the 1930s and, and in the post-war period. So the first thing to think, thinking about this kind of very, this sort of interrupted landscape in politics, much more fragmentation, much more challenge, and then this more mixed and diverse research base is keep an eye on the long view. Remember that you can, some things require you to have deep um, uh, research which can give you the bigger picture on human existence. Very important on things like climate science, of course. Very important for understanding technology. Very important for uh, natural sciences, engineering, as well as the social sciences. Um, and as I say, <coughs> stresses therefore the importance of basic as well as applied research. And of course, you know, those, those two categories overlap. Of course they do. And of critical thinking of thinking of, of allowing society to have critical consciousness of itself. Um, and, and, and of course, these are things that can only really be done in universities. The think tanks can't do <coughs> these things. You can't, you can't do them uh, easily at the front line of practice. You know, these are things which require the resources and capabilities and intellectual resources of, of universities. And again, Walensky would stress in this context the importance, therefore, of integrated and multidisciplinary and systemic policy, that if you are just doing short-run evaluations, if you are just doing cost-benefit, if you are just doing short-run RCTs on a particular issue in policy, then you miss where a lot of your intellectual advance and policy impact comes, which is integrating across disciplines, integrating approaches, and trying to reach more systemic conclusions, to say, well, you can't just analyse this bit of policy, in isolation, in the silo, you have to think about it in much more broader context, and hence the importance of multidisciplinary research and systemic policy. And again, that requires capability, it requires resources that are, are, are only really found in universities, very, very important. And that too, I think, implies trying to cement this role of independent <laughs> knowledge institutions and, and university institutes that, that as IPR does, deliberately try to synthesize and integrate from across disciplines and in particular in the, in current conditions of technological change of climate change the hard and and social you know the, the natural and physical and social <coughs> sciences uh, within a policy context that becomes incredibly important and the task of doing that very very important um also giving if you like giving voice to in a public sphere if you have a more pluralist democracy where some things are happening in Scotland and Wales and London and other things are happening across political parties, then research plays an incredibly important role in helping to frame the public sphere. And in particular, not allowing uh, the kind of polarisation in politics to mean that people talk to each other as citizens within their own sort of side of an argument, you know, the kind of Fox News phenomenon, that basically a, a, the public sphere in which citizens come together is lost because you're talking to each other in parallel channels. Um, and so, again, the importance of research in this context is that it helps to inform a broader public sphere and to keep that public sphere one in which citizens talk to each other rather than allowing it to become uh, fragmented and polarised into, uh, if you like, um, camps of opinion that don't talk to each other, one another and reflect a polarised politics. So retaining a public sphere becomes very important. And then finally, when thinking about RCTs, when thinking about research, when thinking about how you do policy making, uh, you know, what issues you research, how you choose to take forward different policies and so on, ultimately must have a democratic component. I mean, this is, this is what, uh, in an enlightened uh, society, research is all about. It is about enabling citizens to come to informed judgments. And it, too much in this more sort of, if you like, the, if the, the warning from the current kind of landscape I described is that if it is too technocratic or if it is too splintered, across different sites of uh, research knowledge, then the ability for us as a body of citizens in a democracy to shape our policy making will be much harder to, to retain. And so the sort of plea, if you like, is to re remember and, uh, and keep a reference back to um, our democratic obligations and to, the, to retaining the role of uh, enlightened, critical research, science and, and endeavours which are in the service of a wider public good. So there we are. Thank you very much. Thank you.